Dr. Raj's textbook of regional anesthesia led us back to 2700 BC. Here, he describes the first attempts at controlling pain through the use of acupuncture in China for the treatment of various diseases to include neuritis, even before humans had an in-depth understanding of anatomy and physiology. This method, which later migrated to Japan, consists of inserting metal needles at certain points in the body with the aim of counteracting pain and other symptoms. According to Hume Hun Tao, the most famous surgeon in Chinese medical history who was born about A.D. 190 used few drugs and needles and he used cautery in only a few places. If the disease proved resistant to acupuncture and drugs, he then first caused the patient to swallow wine containing an anesthetic effervescent powder which produced intoxication and complete insensibility. He could then perform the desired operation. This shows that although acupuncture was also used as a local anesthetic, it was not always reliable. Raj, 2002. Little else in terms of medical advancement is recorded until the 1200s AD, when according to the British History of Anesthesia Society, Theodoric of Lucca, Italian bishop and physician, is recorded to have used sponges soaked with opium and madragora for surgical pain relief. Featherstone, 2011. Legend has it that along with their advanced surgical techniques, ancient Incas are known to have chewed cocoa leaves and used the numbing saliva on the part of the body to be cut as their early surgical anesthesia. Raj, 2002. Spanish Jesuit Barnabé Cobo, however, is reported by Miller as being the first to have recorded use of the coca plant as a local anesthetic for relief of a toothache in 1653. Miller, 2010. From the 1700s, Fundamental to modern neural blockade and regional anesthesia is the concept that sensory block is accomplished by pharmacologically interrupting specific nerve fibers, modulation or interruption along the nerve's pathway. This outlook may be traced back to early developments in the study of physiology. Plato and Aristotle believed that pain, like pleasure, is a passion of the soul, that is, an emotion and not one of the senses. In his book, Neural Blockade and Clinical Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, Cousins describes how Philosophical changes from the great scientific revolutions of the 18th century and the birth of bryology gradually, although not entirely, efface the religious connotations of pain in Western civilization. These philosophical revolutions of the 18th century were in part based on mechanistic concepts of biologic function that Descartes developed during the 17th century. Descartes matured the concept of a neural connection from the periphery to the brain. Cousins, 2009. The famous military surgeon, Aperet, gave a good description of the use of compression for amputation as described by Roche. It was not until 1784, however, that a young English surgeon, J. Moore, used Descartes' theory to significantly improve the compression method. In experiments on himself, he found that complete insensibility of the whole leg and loss of power to move it could be obtained in about half an hour after he applied compression to the sciatic as well as the cural and obturator nerves. He constructed a special apparatus that facilitated compression of two opposite areas while still permitting a certain flow of blood. In this case, complete insensibility extended only to below the knee. Raj, 2002. Refrigeration seems to have had a short-lived but reportedly somewhat successful run. There are reports from the 1920s of military surgeon D.J. Lowry having performed several painless battlefield amputations due to frigid temperatures. Another military surgeon, Hunter, experimented on himself the idea of the refrigeration pain method by sticking his hand in a wasp's nest and using cold spring water to alleviate the pain. He reported initial pain relief that worsened on removal of his hand. The method of refrigeration didn't really take off after this. Raj, 2002. The search for creative methods of surgical anesthesia continues in 1843 when Elliotson describes the successful use of hypnosis for surgical management of pain. Raj, 2002. Eighteen forty six heralds the rise of general anesthesia with the first public demonstration of its use by William Morton at Massachusetts General Hospital. As described by Raj, early experience of death under the influence of the anesthetic gave renewed urgency to the question of substituting local anesthetic agents for those of general action, end quote. In an article from 1848, Simpson, famous for the introduction of chloroform, 
emphasized that, quote, if we could by any means induce a local anesthesia without the temporary absence of consciousness, which is found in the state of general anesthesia, many would regard it as a still greater improvement in this branch of practice, end quote. Raj, 2002. Advancement continues in 1855 with Francis Rand. Rand's idea to influence neurologic pain comes to fruition when he used a trocar and cannula to introduce morphine hypodermically by gravity around a peripheral nerve. That same year, Wood improved on his idea and delivered the first subcutaneous injection with a hollow needle and glass syringe. Raj, 2002. Now that we have a vessel for delivery, Miller describes how in 1856, Albert Neiman isolated the alkaloid from the dried cocoa leaves, giving it the name cocaine. Vasily von Anrap remarked on its local anesthetic properties and after animal experimentation, suggested its use as a local anesthetic during surgery. Miller, Erickson, Fleischer, Weiner, Cronish, and Young, 2010. Neiman saw little scientific application of his discovery, dying at the age of 27. One can only wonder if he realized the impact cocaine would continue to have for the next several hundred years. Raj credits the decisive step in the development of regional anesthesia to C. Collar, a young Viennese physician who had been working for some time in S. Stricker's experimental pathology laboratory, and who devoted himself to the study of ophthalmology. Both of these circumstances were of importance because Collar became familiar with experimental methods and also had personal experience with the need for using local anesthesia when operating on the eyes. He had observed the unsuitability of general narcosis for eye operations because not only is the cooperation of the patient greatly desirable in such operations, but the sequelae of general narcosis, vomiting, retching, and general restlessness are frequently so severe that they could constitute a grave danger to the operated eye. After experimenting on animals first and then himself, Collar demonstrated the use of cocaine to the General Ophthalmological Society in Heidelberg, Germany. Raj, 2002. Cousins vividly describes how, in 1884, it was, quote, William Stuart Halstead and Richard John Hall and their associates who most clearly saw the great possibilities of conduction block, end quote. In 1884, Hall described how he blocked a cutaneous branch of the ulnar nerve in his own forearm. He and Halstead made injections into the musculocutaneous nerve of the leg and the ulnar nerve. Hall noted the appearance of marked constitutional symptoms, giddiness, severe nausea, cold perspiration, and dilated pupils. This did not daunt these bold pioneers. And that same evening, Halstead blocked Hall's supratrochlear nerve and removed an adjoining congenital cystic tumor. He also induced Nash, a dental surgeon, to tend to Hall's own upper incisor tooth after injection of cocaine into the infraorbital nerve at the infraorbital foramen, and Halstead thereafter performed an inferior dental nerve block on a medical student volunteer and later did the same to Hall. Hall's report was quite explicit in predicting that, once the limits of safety had been determined, this mode of administration would find very wide application in the outpatient department. One would assume that after running out of surgeries to perform on each other, the group would have opened a surgical clinic. The daring experimenters at Roosevelt Hospital unfortunately became addicted to the new drug and Halstead seems to be the only one to overcome his addiction and continue on in the field. Cousins, Carr, Horlocker, and Rittenbaum, 2009. New methods of cocaine administration were soon discovered as experimentation continues in 1885 as Corning, an American neurologist, tried injecting cocaine into the epidural space in an attempt to alleviate pain from neurologic disease. In 1885, Corning published a paper in which he described experiments he had conducted on dogs, injecting 1.18 milliliters of a 2% solution of cocaine hydrochloride into the space quote, situated between the spinous processes of two inferior dorsal vertebra, end quote, with the result that the animal, quote, did not react for several hours even if a stimulus was applied from a powerful phratic battery or if the hind limbs were pinched or pricked, end quote. Corning continued with human experimentation to refine his technique. Raj, 2002. August 16, 1898, surgeon August Beer induced spinal anesthesia with cocaine for the purpose of surgical anesthesia. All of his patients reported vomiting and headache. 
The next day, Beer and his assistant performed spinal anesthesia on each other. Their combined vertigo, headaches, and days of weakness led the pair to deduce that the technique had little advantage over general anesthesia. Brown, 2010. Beer's introduction of spinal anesthesia in surgery followed with a period of continued experimentation with cocaine in the subarachnoid and epidural spaces and using additives to change the pericity of the medication and vary the level of the block. Raj, 2002. News of Beer's work spread quickly, and although he abandoned it himself, his method of subarachnoid spinal anesthesia was soon brought into prominence by Tuffier. The sensation caused by Tuffier's demonstrations is well conveyed by Hopkins, who wrote, quote, to be able to converse with a patient during the performance of a hysterectomy, patient all the while evincing not the slightest indication of pain, and even being unable to tell where the knife was being applied, was certainly a marvel, and was well worth crossing the Atlantic to see." End quote. In 1908, August Beer re-enters the regional anesthesia scene by successfully administering the first direct vein anesthesia, now known as the Beer Block. Raj, 2002. Peripheral nerve stimulators make a quick entrance and exit from the scene in 1912, when von Perse is the first to describe the use of nerve stimulation. Likely due to the complexity of the equipment, the technique was considered impractical. Klein, Melton, Grill, and Nielsen, 2012. In 1920, French surgeon Gaston Lebat published Regional Anesthesia, Its Technique and Clinical Applications. Quote, Gaston Lebat emphasized that the danger of spinal anesthesia was not the fall of blood pressure per se, but rather the associated cerebral anemia, both being attributable to the increased volume of blood in the viscera caused by splanchnic vascular paralysis and vasomotor collapse. End quote. He expressed the belief that this cerebral anemia would be avoided by placing the patient in the Trendelenburg position, immediately following the intraspinal injection, and that, by this procedure, the brain would be kept amply supplied with blood and irremediable respiratory failure would be avoided. To ensure that the blood pressure would not drop during spinal anesthesia, the practice of administering ephedrine subcutaneously was introduced. Cousins, Carr, Horlocker, and Brittenball, 2009. Many sources cite John Lundy as originating the idea of using multiple anesthesia techniques in the 1920s when he outlined his concept of balanced anesthesia. Dr. Bacon of the Mayo Clinic describes in his article how, in 1925, Lundy established the first anatomy lab at the Mayo Clinic. He believed that the lab would serve as a useful tool for teaching residents as well as continuing research into new regional anesthetic techniques. He also describes Lundy's desire to advance the science of anesthesiology with his development of the concept of balanced anesthesia and introduction of barbiturates to the practice of anesthesia. Ellis, Narr and Bacon, 2004. Cousins describes the effect of war necessitating the continued advancement of regional anesthesia and pain management. In the last century, World War II was a stimulus for regional anesthesia development, secondary to two factors. The many injured needed medical care and the introduction of lidocaine to regional techniques. The Seattle personalities, Daniel C. Moore and John J. Banaka, led the effort in the United States to grow both regional anesthesia and pain medicine care, with more primarily focused on regional anesthesia and Banneka on pain medicine. Cousins, Carr, Horlocker, and Brittenbaugh, 2009. The peripheral nerve stimulator re-enters the scene in 1955 when Pearson publishes a modern description of a neurostimulator guided peripheral nerve block, entitled Nerve Block in Rehabilitation, a Technique Needle Localization. Klein, Melton, Grill, and Nielsen, 2012. 
advancement continues and in 1962, Greenblatt and Denson constructed a small portable transistor-based device similar in design and appearance to modern-day nerve stimulators. Klein, Melton, Grill and Nielsen, 2012. In 1973, Montgomery sets the standard when he describes a nerve stimulation technique using standard unsheeted needles and a battery-powered transistor-based peripheral nerve stimulator that was described as safe and successful over an 18-month period involving approximately 1,000 peripheral nerve blocks. Although this study did not report a success rate, it facilitated the gradual transition from mechanical paresthesia to electrical stimulation for nerve localization. Klein, Melton, Grill and Nielsen, 2012. This advancement in nerve stimulation techniques stemmed from the work of Melzack and Wall in 1965. Melzack and Wall provided sound scientific basis for the understanding of pain mechanisms with the gate control theory. Their new theory legitimized pain as a scientific discipline. Rash, 2002. According to Cousins, Melzack and Wall's hypothesis that a spinal gate controls the cephalat transmission of nociception was based on evidence suggesting that the intensity and quality of pain perceived do not bear a push-button straight-through one-to-one relationship to the intensity of the stimulus, but are instead determined by a multiplicity of physiologic and psychologic variables. This led directly to the reintroduction of electrical stimulation as a method for treating chronic pain. Although their gate control theory has been shown to be conceptually incomplete in light of today's understanding, it did provide the framework for most of the advances in understanding spinal cord nociceptive processing. Cousins, Carr, Harlocker, and Bridenbaugh, 2009. Ultrasound guided regional anesthesia joins the picture in 1978. Lagrange et al. reported the use of a Doppler flow ultrasound detector to facilitate supraclavicular blockade of the brachial plexus. To our knowledge, this was the first study in which an indirect sonographic approach was used for regional anesthesia. Manhofer and Fricke, 2006. Progression continues and in 1989, Ting and Sivak Nadanan reported the use of ultrasonography for performing an axillary brachial block. This allowed confirming the localization of the cannula and visualizing the spread of the local anesthetic within the plexus sheath. Using this technique, Ting and C. Vagnatagnan reported a 100% success rate without any complications. However, this study only included a sample of six patients, Capral, Kraft, and Eidenberger, 1994. Improvements in ultrasound have grown tremendously in the past decade. In 2010, the American Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, ASRA, published a study that assessed the evidence-based medicine format for the scientific underpinnings of ultrasound guidance as a tool for nerve localization. This study focused on a review of the previous literature that included block-related outcomes, onset, duration, patient satisfaction, and safety-related outcomes. Although there are limited studies with an adequate sample size, researchers agree that the ultrasound-guided technique offers several advantages over the traditional method. It appears to offer a more profound block with a faster onset and increased patient satisfaction. This method does not completely eliminate complications, however, in the hands of a trained and educated anesthetist, the complications can be minimized. Neil, Brawl, Chan, Grant, and Grant, 2010. The only limitation appears to be training and education of the technique. When this technique is part of the curriculum, in every nurse anesthesia program, expect to see this mastered by nurse anesthetists.
The conflict in Iraq presents the United States military with a need for increasing use of regional anesthesia for battlefield and follow-on pain management. Buckenmeyer, Blicker and Sardik, 2009. Colonel retired Buckenmeyer described his view in his article Regional Anesthesia in Austere Environments, published in 2003. In a field environment, availability of suction, oxygen, and antimedic medications is limited. The advantages of regional anesthesia have economic significance in civilian hospitals, but could be life-saving in the chaotic battlefield environment. Rapid recovery will allow the soldier to be an active participant in his evacuation and reduce the number of medical personnel needed to manage the post-operative recovery area. In addition, the profound analgesia could possibly reduce opioid use in mass casualty situations in which adequate monitoring is difficult and medical personnel are limited. Continuous peripheral nerve block could further extend the benefits of regional anesthesia into post-operative recovery as the soldier is evacuated. Buckenmeyer, Lee, Shields, Samson and Childs, 2003. Colonel Buckenmeyer provided the first successful application of a continuous peripheral nerve block on the battlefield in Operation Iraqi Freedom on October 7, 2003. The nerve block provided the soldier with pain relief from Iraq to Germany and through several surgeries at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, Buckenmeyer, Blecker, Sarek, in 2009. The Military Advanced Regional Anesthesia and Analgesia Initiative was created the same year to disseminate research advances to practitioners. Good morning. We're here today to interview Colonel Retired John Scherner uh, for our project in anesthesia history. Um, members of our group are Major Ma Maxwell Hernandez, Captain Wojcicki, and I am First Lieutenant Townsend. The purpose of this interview today is to gain knowledge from Mr. Scherner about his experience with regional anesthesia throughout his career as a CRNA. Good morning, Mr. Scherner. Thank morning. you for your time. Glad to be um, here. We're going to uh, start with some questions. Uh, can, you tell, can you tell us about your first experience as a nurse anesthetist using regional anesthesia? Uh, just to set the background, I entered anesthesia school. I started anesthesia school in November of 1970 and graduated in May of 1972. And back then, regional anesthesia as a whole was not really anything that was done on a, on a daily basis in the practice of anesthesia. We were just transitioning from that time from, from ether anesthetic to halothane anesthetic uh, and uh, just mainly uh, general anesthesia, either via mask or endotracheal tube intubation. So regional anesthesia was very, very limited back then. Uh, we didn't have the medications, the uh, uh, local anesthetics and the needles that we have today that made it easy for us to do regional anesthesia. So from that standpoint, uh, it wasn't part of our daily practice. Uh, the only regional anesthetic that we really uh, uh, did with any regularity is, as you're aware since you've been in class, uh, uh, an IV beer block, which is an injection of local anesthetic through the vein to make the uh, appendage numb for a period of time. We did axillary blocks with injection of a, of a local anesthetic near the uh, uh, axillary sheath or in the axillary sheath to make the arm nun, numb. And then also uh, we did occasional subarachnoid block anesthesia, mainly for uh, delivery um, in the labor and delivery suite. Uh, and so that was it in the beginning of my uh, educational experience. And then as time went on, uh, regional anesthesia started to gain more popularity. In the mid-1970s, 73, 74, regional anesthesia, specifically spinal anesthesia, was something that was uh, uh, becoming more and more uh, requested by surgeons, by patients, and that prompted uh, our curriculum to change. And so the curriculum of the nurse anesthesia program ad adapted 
uh, regional anesthesia into their curriculum, specifically spinal anesthesia or subarachnoid black anesthesia. For those individuals who already graduated, uh, uh, there was a program that was put in place that we actually uh, established a curriculum. Uh, we had to do a certain number of regional anesthetics, uh, spinal anesthetics, and then we were um, credentialed to, to do spinal anesthesia. So in the 1970s, in the mid-1970s, we started doing uh, more a subarachnoid block for cesarean sections, for uh, uh, orthopedic procedures, and so forth. And as it progressed into the late 1970s, early 1980s, we started doing more and more regional anesthesia, specifically uh, regional anesthesia of the upper extremity, axillary blocks mainly. Uh, and uh, as time progressed, uh, we've come to the 1990s, and one of the things that happened as far as regional anesthesia, which was a boon for us in the military, is that it was mandated by the Department of Defense in 1990 that all mothers who uh, are delivering in a military facility uh, had to be made, had to have the availability of having an epidural anesthesia or analgesia if they wanted to. So that really started the ball rolling, rolling as far as regional anesthesia and epidural uh, for labor and delivery. Now it's common practice in every military facility that uh, a regional anesthesia, specifically epidural anesthesia in the OB suite, uh, is, is that's something that's given 95% of the time. And because of that, uh, in the OB suite, we found that we can use epidural anesthesia in the surgical suite. So we've progressed from just doing uh, IV uh, intravenous local anesthesia to subarachnoid block to extremity blocks, mainly axillary block, to epidural in the AB, uh, OB suite, now uh, epidurals in the, in the surgical suite, and we've progressed now to something even better, and we'll talk about a little bit later, is ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia. All right. Um, could you tell us, could you just kind of piggyback on this curriculum you're talking about, could you tell us a little bit about your specific training in regional anesthesia? Training, again, as I mentioned, uh, in, in the 1970s, regional anesthesia was very, very um, minimally used. Uh, we, did have, we had no requirements by the ANA to have regional anesthesia as part of our training. Uh, if we did, it was kind of an enrichment. It was not required for us at that time. And the only requirement that we had is that we had to monitor, monitor regional anesthesia and what they meant by monitoring was that we, uh, somebody else, the anesthesiologist, put the spinal anesthetic in and then we sat with that individual uh, to monitor them while the surgical procedure was going on. And that's what we got credit for. Uh, however, as you do regional anesthesia, that's only the part of the whole regional anesthesia. Instituting the regional anesthetic, first of all, determine if the regional anesthetic is the appropriate anesthetic for that individual is, is part of our training now. Uh, what type of regional anesthetic, it's going to be an epidural or subarachnoid block, what type of local anesthetic we're going to use, and those types of things, and also how to treat the complications uh, was not dealt with at that time. And it just progressed over a period of time uh, to the point now where we are uh, in the military uh, very, very uh, fortunate to have the ability to do regional anesthesia uh, of every type and every kind that we want to at this point in time. Mr. Scherner, um, I'd like to focus on, on the peripheral nerve blocks um, specifically. Could you just tell us um, a little bit about the transition from the um, nerve stimulation technique to the ultrasound guided technique? Yes, I'd be glad to. One of the things that we, we as regional anesthesia developed over the period of time, we found that our success rate just by using superficial landmarks, uh, uh, bony structures, muscles, and so forth, uh, did not provide us a reliable method of having regional anesthesia be effective 100% of the time. Uh, everybody's anatomy is a little bit different. Uh, we had some difficulty in doing a regional anesthetic and not having a very good uh, outcome from it. So it was developed in the mid-1980s to late 1980s. Um, another means of delivering, uh, trying to administer regional anesthesia by the use of a peripheral nerve stimulator. And what that is, is using the electrical current uh, that's channeled through a needle, and as we place the needle close to the uh, appropriate nerve structure that we want, whether it's a brachial plexus or, or a femoral nerve or another nerve in the lower extremity, uh, that nerve would respond to that electrical stimulation. And depending how close we were to that nerve uh, would determine uh, uh, when we would inject our local anesthetic. And by doing it th this method, uh, it provided a more reliable, more effective way of um, performing regional anesthesia, although uh, the success rate went up, uh, it, did not go, it did not go high enough. 
and we wanted to find something that would be better uh, to provide us more reliability in do, doing regional anesthesia. So that progressed to the anesthesia community looking at other uh, methods of determining um, uh, how we would do regional anesthesia. Also another sidelight that the incidence of complications sometimes was a little bit higher than we wanted to with a, a peripheral nerve stimulator, uh, nerve damage, uh, uncomfortable to the patient. Uh, and so uh, although it worked for the period of time that it was in, in, in process, it's now becoming something that's almost obsolete and may be used for specific nerve blocks only. Okay, great, thank you. Sir, could you elaborate a little on the uh, use of the ultrasound technique? What has happened over the last uh, probably six to seven years is that uh, new technology has made uh, regional anesthesia even a more attractive uh, anesthetic for not only the anesthesia provider, but also the patients. And that's ultrasound regional guided anesthesia. Uh, it started out as something that was used to, to identify certain structures and then individuals uh, used the ultron to start, start placing needles close to those structures. And the next thing we knew, we were injecting local anesthetic uh, via the ultrasound uh, technique. Um, and what has happened over the last six or seven years, um, uh, we first had to sell our surgical colleagues that this was indeed a very appropriate way to do regional anesthesia. Mm -hmm. um, when we do regional anesthesia, there is a, a, a people are always concerned about how long does it take to administer regional anesthesia. And in the civilian community, time is money. If we take 20 minutes to do a regional anesthetic, that's 20 minutes that the patient's not in the operating room having the surgical procedure, and that, that adds up over a period of a day, a week, a, a month, and a year. Uh, but we, we've been able to, to show the surgeons that doing ultrasound regional anesthesia is very, very effective, does not take as much time as a peripheral, guided, a peripheral nerve stimulator guided regional anesthesia, and that our, our blocks work very, very, very well most of the time. Uh, the technique, uh, uh, has developed today where we specifically when we started regional anesthesia we had an ultrasound machine that was used for other things besides regional anesthesia. We just borrowed it from the ultrasound lab, we borrowed, borrowed it, the machine from the vascular surgeon, we borrowed it from the OB uh, people who used ultrasound to look at the fetus. Uh, and so uh, now we have ultrasound machines that are specifically made uh, for anesthesia. The resolution is much better specifically um, has the things that we need to make sure that we indeed do a very, very good job with our re regional anesthetic and increases the efficacy and efficiency of it very, 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 very much. Um, so ultrasound, again, is something that we feel um, is something that has to be incorporated in our curriculum. It's something that uh, um, if we do not offer that, our practitioners, our graduates of our program will be behind the power curve as far as regional anesthesia goes. And just as a sidelight, uh, to digress just a little bit, uh, how did regional anesthesia in the military affect regional anesthesia in the civilian community? Uh, if it were not for regional anesthesia done by military nurse anesthetists, nurse anesthetists in the civilian community would not be doing regional anesthesia. Uh, the ANA, our American Association of Nurse Anesthetists, uh, uh, proudly states that the nurse anesthetists in the military, both the Army, Air Force, and the Navy, were the big proponents that prompted uh, civilian nurse anesthetists to do regional anesthesia. Uh, we learned in the military, we stayed in the military for a period of time, uh, got out of the military, went into the civilian community, and so we were trained to do regional anesthesia. Uh, we found that it was a good anesthetic or a safe anesthetic for a particular individual, a particular case, a particular surgical procedure, and we did those. Uh, and that prompted other people, other civilian schools, to prompt to, to them to also incorporate regional anesthesia into their um, uh, uh, curriculum and also changed the legally uh, state practices on regional anesthesia. Uh, several years ago in many, many states, nurse anesthetists were not legally allowed to do regional anesthesia. Because we do it's commonplace now, uh, most states allow nurse anesthetists uh, in our standards of practice to do regional anesthesia. So we have had a big impact on uh, the civilian community as well as the um, um, military community. We progressed from, again, from just a anatomical landmarks using regional anesthesia to peripheral nerve stimulators to now ultrasound guided regional anesthesia. And the curriculum here, uh, I'll take a small part of the uh, credit for incorporating it in the curriculum. Uh, Colonel retired John Craig, uh, United States Air Force, who's now the VA representative, was probably one of the founding fathers of doing restarting regional anesthesia. I came right after he did, so together we started 
to do regional anesthesia in our curriculum, started doing labs, started doing cadaver labs for regional anesthesia. And then uh, Dr. Gasco uh, was also uh, very, very uh, helpful in starting the uh, uh, program and bringing it to where it is now, and Colonel Forrester, the Air Force representatives. So the combination of the four individuals um, merged our expertise together and uh, by little by little, I think we have one of the best ultrasound guided regional anesthesia curriculums in the country. We have the equipment, uh, we have the, the space, we have the cadaver labs, uh, so that when, you, when the students leave here, uh, they know how to identify structures uh, using the ultrasound guided uh, technique, and they just have to put that into practice when they go to the phase two for the cl clinical experience. Thank you, sir. Uh, we, we appreciate all the work that all of you have done in that program and that you still, still help us out with. I, I, I enjoy it. Good morning. Um, my name is Maxwell Hernandez, and uh, um, I'm here to ask um, some questions about your experience, Mr. Scherner, with uh, regional anesthesia. So now that we've uh, uh, talked a little bit about um, uh, how regional, the practice of regional anesthesia began uh, in the profession of uh, uh, nurse anesthesia. Uh, we would like to um, ask you, where do you see uh, regional anesthesia for nurse anesthetists going into the future? Uh, that's a very good question, and I, I'm excited for you as students who are graduating in the next, uh, well, two years, I guess. Uh, uh, it seems like a long time to you, but it's really a short time uh, in the overall big picture because I think things are going to be changing and, and things are even going to get much, much better. Technology is advancing so rapidly in so many areas, but specifically in ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia. As I mentioned now, there are several companies out there that have specifically uh, made uh, ultrasound machines specifically for anesthesia. They're very, very portable. Uh, they're very easy to move from one place to the other, very, very easy to clean, very easy to operate. And the resolution, the picture that you will see, is going to be much, much better than we have uh, currently. So I think that's very, very uh, good from that standpoint. I think also uh, technology as far as the needles that we use for ultrasound guided regional anesthesia are going to be much, much better. It's going to be much, much, much easier for you to identify the needle uh, where it is in relationship to the structures that we want to anesthetize. Uh, and I think that's going to be a, a benefit for everybody. I think what's going to happen, and I don't know very much uh, specifically uh, where the research is going, but, but if any of you have seen a 3D picture of a, of a, of a, a sonogram of a fetus, uh, how, how that picture is compared to a regular ultrasound, I believe in the next five or ten years we may have 3D ultrasound guided uh, 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 technique for regional anesthesia. We'll actually be able to see the nerves much, much better than we are now through a 3D type of uh, uh, advancement in technology. So I think that's something that's going to be very, very exciting from that standpoint um, and uh, uh, will make things much, much, much better uh, for us from, uh, overall. Um, I think what's going to happen also as we do more, do more and more regional anesthesia, especially ultrasound guided, and can show our surgical colleagues and our patient population that it's something that's worthwhile for them, uh, that success rate is very, very good, time for... Uh, putting an ultrasound needle in and getting a, a response that we want after an injection of local anesthesia is much faster than some of the other techniques. Uh, the patient satisfaction is going to be higher. Also, we haven't really touched on uh, using ultrasound guided regional anesthesia for postoperative pain. We just talked specifically about doing it for uh, performing it for uh, regional anesthesia for surgical procedures. Uh, I think the big selling point is to have um, long-acting local anesthetics or a catheter placement that will last. Uh, two to three days, uh, uh, the patient will go home with that catheter in place with a, some type of self-infusing uh, local anesthetic, and after three days, the patient takes out the catheter himself, uh, and that's going to provide a, a satisfactory post-operative pain relief. The patient's going to be much, much happier. The surgeons are going to be much happier because they don't get called because the patient's having pain. So I think the combination of the ultrasound technique and some of the things with um, uh, in, inserting catheters or using long-acting local anesthetics is going to really make ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia um, an easy sell for our colleagues and for our patients. So mostly in the, in the field of uh, technical uh, equipment, uh, um, actually uh, 
uh, being able to uh, visualize the nerve. That's where most of the advances. I think so. I think so. Uh, it's already, we already have some mechanisms in place that we actually will steer the ultrasound beam to help look for the needle rather than us manipulating the probe. Uh, and so that, I think that's something that's going to be happening. The needles are going to get better, um, <coughs> excuse me, from that standpoint. Uh, and so I think uh, initially um, in the military we had some resistance from some of our anesthesia colleagues about nurse anesthetists um, uh, utilizing regional anesthesia ultrasound guided. Uh, but I think we've kind of put that uh, monster to bed and it's not an issue uh, in most places. Uh, and uh, when you go out to, um, and I found in the last three years, that the students leave here and they go out to their phase two sites for their clinical experience, uh, they know more about ultrasound anesthesia than the staff does. And they're teaching the staff as far as uh, both nurse anesthetists and anesthesiologists about ultrasound guided regional anesthesia. And that's a good selling point from us. So I think uh, the future, <coughs> excuse me, is very, very rosy from our standpoint that uh, we will always be doing ultrasound guided regional anesthesia. And I'll also be interested in, and what we're going to have is an ultrasound guided regional anesthesia field type of equipment. It has to be a little bit more robust, it has to be you know, heat and cold sensitive, uh, intolerant rather. Uh, so I think we're going to see in the military aspect, we're going to take some of this technology that we use in the civilian community and it's going to be transposed to the field environment, uh, just made a little bit more robust, a little bit uh, lighter footprint or whatever. Uh, and we will be doing regional anesthesia um, in a field environment in Afghanistan. We're already doing it now, uh, but it's going to be even more available. Well, thank you, Mr. Scherner. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. We really appreciate it. Thank you.